floor over to Michael. So, um, and especially thank you for being here because this was kind of like a little bit hastily arranged, the last minute kind of thing. Um, I'm going to ask us to uh, think together through the things that I'm going to be talking about. And um, so, and I also want us all to like take this kind of personally, like this is, this is not just an about sort of conversation. So I'm going to be talking for a while. And, um, but I invite you to engage with what I'm talking about, like looking for yourself. So it's not just, you know, like just pure theory, unless, except that any theory is really as, as much about us as, as it is about anything. Um, so the, the name of this talk is the inner game of agility. And um, uh, so what's personal for me about this is that I find that as much as I teach and talk about and coach this thing that I'm calling inner agility or sense and respond leadership, the truth is, is that much of the time I personally suck at it. I'm actually not very, I, so inner agility is, like it's it's a pretty tall order and I'm inviting us all to take on that tall order um, because otherwise we're just sort of pussyfooting around we're not really um, nothing's going to become of what we're doing this great work that we're doing around agility and um, so <clears throat> does that sound too serious that's kind of serious or somber, a little bit somber. It doesn't have to be somber, right? So, um, so what, I, uh, what I really want us to do is to be thinking about the nature of the learning organization. So I'm going to talk for maybe about 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a conversation. So, and as I'm speaking, if you have a question, feel free to bring the question in. So I'm completely interactive media. And if it feels like the question might be better suited for a little bit later, I'll say, can we hold that question for later? So, but whatever question you have, feel free to bring it. So, so this is about, ultimately it's about the uh, what's the nature of a learning organization. And as far as I'm concerned, the best I can tell, so I've been in, in this agile game for a very, very long time, maybe about 20 years. And I started bringing agility into the corporate world in, in, in 2004. And for me, it was always about how do we create conditions that make a learning organization possible? That, you know, because I came from the, my background was Peter Senge, organization development, systems thinking. Uh, professional coaching, facilitation. That was my background. That's what I came into this with. And so I naturally had a holistic way of thinking about it. And um, something happened along the way that I started to realize that a learning organization necessarily requires individuals to be able to up their level of consciousness. So this is not like we talk about learning an organization as an abstraction, but it's really, it's how do we create conditions that make possible deep learning in individuals such that that kind of learning brings their level of consciousness up so that they become better able to deal with the complexity of, of the world and particularly the complexity of the organization. So this is about helping us raise the complexity of mind within ourselves. So I'm reminding us to take this seriously. So as I'm speaking, I'm literally each moment aware of what's the nature of the complexity that I'm able to deal with in this moment. So 
So it's about learning organizations. And um, so here are the topics that I want to cover tonight. Some are similar to ones that I've covered in the past. So especially in the beginning, so don't worry, this is not the same talk that I've done before. This is a different one. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is VUCA. How many people have heard of VUCA? Yeah. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So we're going to unpack that a bit. And what it calls for is that we make a shift in mindset from predict and plan to sense and respond. And so I'm going to say a bit what I mean by that. Then I want to um, unpack what I'm calling a sense and respond operating system. So there's a way of thinking about this sense and respond mindset from the inside out as, as a kind of an operating system. Inner agility versus outer agility. So what's, you know, what, what is the nature of inner agility? And What's the anatomy of sense making? So, so one of the things that I would say is that sense making is, is kind of like the deep kernel um, capacity of, of, in, of inner agility, of individuals to bring this greater complexity. And then finally, the nature of deliberate sense making. How can we be deliberate about our sense making? Okay, so, so getting back to originary principles. VUCA. It's volatility, it's uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And the way we normally approach it is from a predict and plan perspective. So from a predict and plan, we assume that we can predict the future and on the basis of that prediction, make a plan. And then when the plan doesn't work out so well, we think, well, we must have left something out. We must have forgotten about something. Or the plan may not have been good enough. We need to upgrade that plan a bit next time we do it. And so what happens over the process is that the structures and systems that we put in place get more and more complicated. We just keep adding more structures, more processes, and the whole thing becomes incredibly complicated. And so when I, when I go into companies, I'm amazed at how complicated everything is. Who else, who else has seen that? Yeah. And, and what is it that you see when you see this? What's the kind of like, what's the quality? I'm going to hear from a couple of people. I actually want, I want to kind of bring you in more. Things get a bit uh, chaotic. A lot of, just a lot of processes, like you said. Yeah. So, it's, so there's a lot of processes and then things start to feel kind of chaotic. Like, like they paradoxically by adding more product, uh, processes, by trying to make it more predictable, we make it more unpredictable. Is that, is that kind of what you're, yeah. And you had something? Yeah, I was gonna say there tends to be a heavy bureaucracy mm. because if there's one or two exceptions that happen, a whole new process goes Yeah, that's right, that's that, right, that's right. So it's not really value add, yeah. it's add on. Right, so we just keep adding it, adding on, and pretty soon we have something that's so complicated that you know it, it becomes even more unpredictable. So now the essential model of the of, of predict and plan is this idea that that organizations are essentially just complicated machines, and we all basically assume that. I mean, this is not just like something that they do. I'd, I'd like to incriminate ourselves, that we kind of assume that things are kind of like a machine. We assume that our families are kind of like machines. We assume that maybe our partnerships are kind of like machines. Now, we don't call it that, but that's the basic assumption. The basic assumption is that essentially these are complicated problems and that if we just apply enough knowledge, enough wisdom, enough whatever, we can solve them. Does that seem like a reasonable, like, like, like where we tend to come from? Would you agree? Sort of. No, not reasonable, but it's where we come. Huh? It's not reasonable, but it's where we come from. Yeah, oh, oh, that's cool. So it's not reasonable, but it's where we come from. Well, it's kind of, it is kind of reasonable, it's where we come from. So I want to propose like a different way of approaching VUCA, because remember we're talking about 
you know, sense, uh, predict and plan is perfectly okay in a world that's predictable, but in a world that's not so predictable, predict and plan doesn't really work. Sense and respond, sense and respond assumes that we cannot predict the future. In fact, it almost celebrates it. And so sense and respond is about developing the capability. So this is not something we just wake up being able to do. It's about developing the capability to sense what's happening and then respond in a way that's appropriate, that's congruent with what's happening. And then sense and then respond. And um, the basic assumption with sense and respond is that it's a living systems. So we, we, we start to see systems as inherently complex, not complicated. Complicated is like a machinery, and if we just get to bring enough intelligence, enough uh, um, um, uh, subject matter expertise, we can solve it. But in a predict and plan world, we realize that, we, that it, it just doesn't work that way. So it's like this uh, ecologist that I knew who worked on restoring prairies in Illinois. Has anyone ever seen a prairie in Illinois? They're like, they're marvelous. I mean, they're so complex and so rich. Any square foot of a prairie has like a hundred different plants and maybe a hundred different sort of insects and animals living in there. They're amazingly complex. And so they asked him, so how do we restore prairie? And he came back and he said, well, what you need to do is you need to burn down the trees, you need to kill the deer, you need to introduce coyotes, you need to introduce rattlesnakes, you need to uh, burn this. So he, he gave them suggestions that were completely preposterous. These were, you know, like people who were trying to like restore the prairie. But it's because it's a complex system. The kinds of solutions are not like, they're not readily understandable. And that is as true for ourselves as it is for the systems that we're working in. So, how is this, how is this going? So far, so good? Welcome. I just came in from Philadelphia, my apologies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Well, thanks. thank you for being here. I'm glad, I'm glad you made it. Okay. So sense and respond operating system. So I, I kind of like the operating system metaphor. And the reason I like it is because, you know, um, on our phones we have all these apps. And what I'm aware of is that if I don't upgrade the operating system on my phone, a lot of those apps aren't going to work very well. The, uh, other people have kind of similar thing. So, and it's kind of like that in organizations. So we ask managers and leaders, for instance, to adopt a more agile approach to management and leadership. So we're, in a sense, we're asking them to be able to run a different app, but unless they are able to upgrade the inner operating system on which those apps run, those apps aren't going to run so well. And so what we want to talk about now is what is the nature of that inner operating system? Because it is, I mean, operating system is kind of like a metaphor. Right, obviously. And um, <clears throat> so what's the nature of that operating system? Well, so first, it starts with us sensing something. And by the way, this operating system operates at the level of an organization, at the level of a team, at the level of just like a pair, like a, like a, a partnership. And it operates at the level of us as individuals, how our own inner sense making works, how we work. So we sense something around us. And on the basis of what we sense, we make sense. Or let me just put it this way. Sense gets made because it's oftentimes not us who is doing the sense making. The sense making is happening behind the scenes. And then on the basis of that sense making or that making sense, we respond and then we come back around. So, and it's this kind of, you know, loop like this. It's this kind of process. And so you can see this operating in Scrum. So in Scrum, we examine 
you know, the potentially shippable product increment in Scrum, we sense, as, in a sense, what we're, we're sensing that, and on the basis of that, we come back around to the next sprint, and that influences how we plan and design the next sprint, how we carry out the next sprint, which is the response, and then we come back. So sense and respond. We can see this also in lean startup. So in the measure part of, the lean, of, the, of this whole loop, of this whole build, measure, learn loop, we're sensing, and then we respond in order to build, and so on. So you can, we can see the sense and respond being applied uh, in, in all different ways. These are just a couple of different examples. So all of this is what you might call outer agility, which is the, the, the structures, the processes, the ceremonies, all of these things that we do, that we spend a lot of time getting, trying to get better and better in our organizations. And it seems as though oftentimes what happens is that we, 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 we're, we're, we're getting better and better at this outer agility, and then things start to slow down, don't they? It gets harder and harder, and it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like stirring like flour and water. You ever put flour and water? At first it's really easy, and then, you're st and then it gets harder and harder, and pretty soon you can't even move that, that, that spoon. And it's kind of like that with, with Agile in most places. It just gets harder and harder and harder. And I would like to suggest that the reason it gets harder is that we're missing an entire dimension here. And the dimension that we're missing is what I am calling inner agility, which is our inner capacity for sense and respond. To be able to sense and respond, to be able to truly be adaptive within our own consciousness and in our, in our capacity as in, in our relationships. So, so much of what we're going to be talking about now is about inner agility or mindset. How many, what do people think of mindset, this word? I'm curious. Sounds so good Okay, so, so mindset suggests it's not just, it's just the mind, right? And it's also set. And it's set. So it's not very adaptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, who, uh, who else? Who, uh, who else has a thought about the term mindset? We, we use this term all, uh, all the time, and I'm just kind of curious how people are using it here. Yes, please, the, in the I back. I use it um, in mastery. Mastery? Yeah, so being agile as opposed to doing agile, and so that has to do with mindset. Yep. <coughs> Someone else, who else? Yes, please. Yes. Hi, David. Hi. Good to see you. Um, I've often defined agile as a way of looking at the world. Uh-huh, yeah, that yeah. I think best expressed as yeah. a mindset. Yes, yeah. Okay. It, yeah, yeah, as, as a mindset. So what I, what I you know, so I, I read a lot about this, the term mindset. And there's the book called Mindset and, and all this. And the way that I hear it used in the Agile world, for the most part, is that it's used, the word mindset is used as a kind of anthropology. So did I tell you at the beginning that I'm going to ask you to kind of think with me? So, so imagine what we might mean by mindset as anthropology. And what I mean by anthropology is that it's something which is studied from the outside. That anthropologists go and they study cultures, and they study, they want to be able to see it as though from the outside. And there's a whole, you know, um, debate within the world of anthropology about whether or not you should study other cultures from the inside or from the outside. But most anthropologists, in the way that I'm talking about it here, is that we study mindset as, as something that's happening out there. It's in those people. And it's something that we can somehow direct and tune in its kind of an external way. I'd like to propose a different, I'm about ready to throw a word here. 
You guys ready? Some of you who know me. Mindset as phenomenology. See, what I love about words, what I love about words is that they help us see things that are obvious in a non-obvious way. And I love the word phenomenology because it's about studying the nature of the mind from inside the mind as opposed to outside the mind. So usually when, we're, when in, you know, we treat agile culture, we treat agile mindset as this thing that we need to somehow change. We need to change those people. We need to change that culture. And I'm suggesting that we need to adjust the way that we're thinking about things like mindset and culture from that which we need to change from the outside to that which we need to shift or transform from the inside, namely from within us. So what is this, what might this look like? So we can go back to this sense and response sort of operating model, right? And at the basis, in the background of it all, is this thing called sense making. And sense making has a number of characteristics. So first of all, um, by the way, I'm using a somewhat more um, accessible term for this. There are, there are very specific psychological words that refer to this, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. Um, but the basic idea here is that at every moment, we're engaged in trying to make sense of our world, and it's not we, it's not we who are doing the making sense. The, the making sense is determined by an inner, like a kernel, sense making that happens outside of our awareness. It happens within milliseconds. Like right now, you're trying to make sense of what I'm saying. And you may be having certain thoughts about what I'm saying. Oh, this is silly, or this is interesting, or this is fascinating, or this is boring, or whatever it is. And all of those thoughts are not thoughts that you are creating. You think you are. And in fact, here it gets even worse. Many of those thoughts you're not even aware of. They're simply there happening maybe 100 per second. Like, like in Tibetan Buddhism, so I've, I've spent years studying Tibetan Buddhism as a practicing Buddhist. And the, what they tell us is that there are like 100 thoughts per second, and most of which we don't, we're unaware. And they determine how we perceive what's going on around us. What we see, what we don't see. What we sense, what we don't sense. How we, what kind of action makes sense to us, what kind of action doesn't make sense to us. And it's going on constantly. And so this is this layer called sense making. And it determines, our, it, it's, it's constituted by our beliefs, our assumptions, our values. I'm saying it are as though they are ours. But they're actually, we are theirs. They don't, they don't belong to us. We belong to them. Does that make sense? Am I stretching the envelope a little too hard right now? I'm seeing some looks of consternation. So, so let me just check in. So what are you making of this so far? It sounds very similar to Uda. To Uda? Yeah. In what sense does it seem similar to Uda? I mean, have you seen Boyd's charts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's been a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I'm familiar. I'm familiar with Uda. What I'm not. What I can't. I'm not drawing the ca connection between that and this thing that happens in the human mind, that is outside of our awareness for the most part, right. right? And determines how we make sense of our world. So, who else has a thought about this? I'm going to want to just find out where people are at. Yeah. So speak a little louder, please, um, Manisha. I've heard uh, about this many, many times, yeah. but maybe because uh, it comes from a culture who talks a lot about mindfulness. And I've heard that not in the agile world, uh -huh, but yeah. uh, uh -huh, more, uh -huh. the, uh, more towards the mindfulness. Yes, and yes. That, so, um, and when we talk about mindset, it all 
always always bring up uh, you know it always bring up that complexity yes. in the mind. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, normally when I'm talking yeah. to middle management as a I will avoid using mindset as a word. Right. Because then the complexity that we are comes with, oh, she's talking about making some changes and that's going to be like a big thing. Right. Right, because there's something going on in their sense, their inner sense making that determines how they're making sense of what you're saying. Yep, yep. Cool, thank you. Yeah, Simon. Um, what, what might you say about the somatic experience? Because that's what lots of our bodies are doing. Yeah, yeah. That we're, we're connecting to our thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just put all these up here just so that we have a frame to look at it. So somatically what, what happens, uh, at least from the, from the relatively little brain science I know, is that we have, we have this part of the brain called the amygdala, and something happens, and the amygdala floods the body with all kinds of chemicals, and we have a certain somatic experience, and part of sense-making, so when I talk about mind, I don't, I'm not talking about just the cognitive mind. I'm talking about all aspects of the mind, the aspect of the mind that actually exists in our cells the aspect of the mind that actually floods the body with chemicals, and we have thoughts and feelings. We have all kinds of feelings, you know, constantly, second by second, we have feelings, which are really, it's a somatic experience. A feeling is putting together a sensation we have in the body with a thought, and, and, and that's a feeling, like the feeling of excitement. How many people are excited right now? Anyone? <laughs> so some people are excited. Well, I, I've actually heard that from the perspective of the somatic experience, there is no difference between excitement and fear. They are identical. Yeah. The only thing that's different is what's the thought. So the mind is a tricky, tricky thing, and we think we understand ourselves. I don't think we do. And that's okay, we don't need to, because it's a VUCA world, and our mind is a VUCA place. And isn't it cool? So we can actually, we, we can sense and respond with our own mind. And in our own relationships, by the way. So I have an amazing wife named Suzanne, who challenges me day by day. When I think I'm doing really, really well, <laughs> she reminds me of the ways that I'm not doing so well. And that's, the, that's really the beauty of, of, of having a wife like that. Because I get to see how I'm operating that I'm not seeing. And it's all in this domain, all in this domain of sense making. Again, I want to reiterate that I'm using sense making. It's a stand, it's a more accessible stand in term for uh, terms that they use in, uh, in, in psychology. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this? So, this? so we can think of this as a way of being. So if, if you collect all of the, the kind of language of of inner beliefs and assumptions and values and mental models and preferred sense-making modalities and all that kind of stuff. If we, uh, if we take all of that together as a kind of gestalt in ourselves or in other people, that gives a certain quality of being. There's a certain, pa there's a certain pattern in here, isn't there? In each one of us. It's partly, in a sense, you can say that who we are being, a lifetime of who we are being, is etched into our face. It's etched into our body. It's etched into our body language. It's there at all moments. And it determines how we perceive the world, how we see the world, what we think makes sense, how we sense. You know, one of the things I'm working on lately is developing my deep intuition to be able to feel into the sort of intuitive space. I, that might sound crazy to some people, but, it's, but it is a legitimate sensing mechanism, right? And we all know that it is. We can all set, we all have a strong intuition. We just lose our contact with it. And so part of this is what do we sense with? Okay, so I've been going on for a long time on this, this whole thing here. Um, good, so it's a way of being. So. The, the next thing I want to say about all of this is that this exists, this quality of being, this sense making, this, this inner kernel operating system. So I can sense that you're with me now. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a while, doesn't it? You know, because you're checking me out. Is this guy legitimate? Is he crazy? Or, and I'm checking you out. I'm checking myself out in the presence of you. 
So we're kind of finally starting to meet here, aren't we? You, you guys sense that? Yeah? It's okay to say yes. It's okay, it's okay to say no. <laughs> you may not sense it, right? But that's part of the field, right? And we all sense the field, but we tend to turn, the, we tend, we turn off the faucet on a lot of our sensing because we don't, we've been convinced that it's not real. And I'd like to suggest that it is very real. So anyway, so there's our individual sense-making capacity. We just lost. Coming back? OK, good. Awesome. <laughs> Going to keep people in here. <laughs> what do I need to do? Throw a party. <laughs> All right, so, so there's individual, so there's that inner sense making that happens in, in, at the level of the individual, at each, in each one of us, and there's sense making that happens within collectives or relationship systems. So, um, by the way, I can make these slides available uh, afterwards, and it's a really good idea to take notes because the slides are very minimal. Um, so, there's the sense making that happens in collectives. So in any relationship, there is a collective, there's a, a pattern of collective sense making that happens. And every team, every agile team has a pattern of collective sense making. And every organization has, a, or ev every larger social system has a pattern of inner sense making. We call that culture. That's what, that's what culture is is that inner sense making that happens at the level of large collectives. And, but it's culture experienced from the inside as opposed to culture experience, it's ex culture experienced phenomenologically as opposed to culture you know, that we can uh, look at anthropologically. Is this, is this whole thing making sense, anthropology? Okay, all right. Um, okay, good. So individual and collective. So, what makes organizational situations challenging often has nothing to do with the challenges themselves. So I go into companies and I say, so what are some of your biggest challenges? And they tell me they're their biggest challenges. And that tells me a lot about the nature of the way that they make sense. Their sense making, their collective sense making, and their individual sense making. So I can either set about to help them try to solve the challenges as they see it, or we could set about helping them to shift the nature of their sense making such that they see the situation in a different light. So that the situations themselves, to some degree, stop being challenging. It doesn't mean there are no challenges, it's just new ones. There, believe me, there's a whole infinity of challenges waiting at the door. But isn't it cool to be able to open the door and find a challenge that's a match for a higher level of complexity than dealing with those challenges that keep us stuck and mired and that we're, that we're never evolving. So I think of new and um, angst provoking challenges as a signal of our evolution, of, the, of our development of, of our complexity of sense making. All right, so. <clears throat> So the anatomy of sense making, I want to just go, th go through a little bit about what psychology is doing. Is this, is this getting too much or are we just getting interesting? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, 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 okay. I can see that, okay. I'm, I'm a little insecure because I always, um, I always feel like, um, I used to be an avant-garde composer years ago. I mean, seriously, really out there music. If you heard the stuff I used to compose, you wouldn't consider it music. And I, and I became very insecure about it. You know, like I've always felt like my ideas are too complicated, or too, you know, they're really too complex. And so that's why I'm kind of checking in, right? It's part of my insecurity. Um, so, <clears throat> so we have these two different dimensions. This is, this is from the field of developmental psychology. So we're going to throw in a little bit of developmental psychology. Developmental psychology, have been, have they been studying this stuff for 100 years. In fact, arguably, you could say that they've been studying it for thousands of years. If you think about the ancient wisdom traditions, the yoga traditions, the Buddhist traditions, 
They've been looking at the nature of mind for a really long time, but certainly in the Western world for at least a hundred years. So, I mean, it's incredibly stupid in the Agile world that we would ignore this. Because this is, I mean, to some degree, I regard this stuff as this, this is what's going to save our ass in the Agile world. That's my perspective, right? A perspective. Okay, good. So, we have this horizontal dimension, which is competence, skill, and action. These are the things that we're able to do. So, if I were a skier, which I'm not, I, these, this would refer to my ability for skiing. If I were, you know, like a karate uh, person, I would refer to my skillfulness in, in karate, right? So, this dimension refers to what we think, what we sense, and what we can do. The other dimension, which is inner sense making, which is what we've been talking about, is how we think, how we sense, and how we do it. And it's the how, it's the inner sense making that determines our competency, skill, and action. So how many people have ever had the experience of seeing somebody go to a really awesome leadership or communication workshop, and they come back and like they're, they're completely unable to exercise those skills and competencies that they learn. Have you ever seen that? I mean, all the time. Is that if, you? Huh? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, well, I'm trying to be a little polite here tonight. Uh, but yeah, because it is, because it is us. It's like, it's that phenomenon where you see this person banging their head against the same wall time and time and time again. You think, what in the heck is going on? Why don't they get it? And the reason is, they don't get it. It's the how we think, it's the how we sense, it's the how we do it that determines whether or not we can get it. It's that simple. We're not going to, we can't continue to bang those skills into them. They're not like, uh, like in, um, what's this? Something you'd press, like you, like a stamp something into. Someone help me out here, huh? Uh, no, it's like a, it's like you know, you melt the wax and then you put a stamp on it. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? A wax seal, yeah. So, like, once that wax dries up, that seal ain't gonna go in. So, and the, so it's, it's, to, so the how. Another way of saying this is that the inner game determines the outer game. This is. Uh, this is how uh, Bob Anderson talks about it in his book, Mastering Leadership, which if you haven't read that book and you're interested in leadership, you should definitely look at that book. Okay, so, so this is horizontal and vertical. So I'm going to use these terms for, for a little bit and what happens next. So, all right, now we're going to get into a little bit further into this. So, this is an example of a shift in vertical development a shift in inner sense making. So consider uh, this guy named Jean Piaget. How many people have heard of Jean Piaget? Okay, yeah, a lot of you. So he used to do these very, very ingenious experiments with children to, dis to discover the nature of their inner sense making. He had to, he, again, he had a different terminology. I'm using inner sense making just because it's a little bit more accessible terminology. Um, but in this one experiment, what he did is that he, he had two beakers of liquid, exact identical beakers with exact identical liquid, and he put them in front of the child. And then he would pour one beaker, one of those beakers, into a, a, a fatter, shorter uh, uh, beaker or cup. And then he poured the other identical beaker into a thinner but taller beaker. And then he'd show those two resulting beakers to the child and say, so which has the more liquid? What would that, what would this, the younger child say? Yeah, the one with the larger, the one, the taller, thinner one. Because at that age, the human being is subject, listen to this wording, is subject to their perceptions. In other words, what they perceive is what's real. So they don't have the capacity to have an objective relationship to their perceptions. Now, the older child, look how smug he looks. Because he, he figured it out. He, he said, well, the taller one has to have the same amount as the, small, as the shorter one because they were poured from identical beakers. So he is no longer subject to his perception. 
he is able to be, uh, hold his perception as object. So this is language that comes from the world of, of developmental psychology. So why is that important? Well, why that's important is that the, the child, by the way, the older child is, is not smarter than the younger child, is he? No. Would you say that, that, that he's smarter? How are we defining this? Well, I mean, in terms of like intelligence, this, the older child is not more intelligent necessarily than the younger child. He just has a different complexity of sense. What were you going to say? Perspective. Of different perspective. I'm going to be a little more precise than that. He has a different complexity of sense making. Or in other words, he has within him a different higher level of complexity in his capacity for sense making, which makes possible a whole range of things that this older child is now able to do. So on the horizontal dimension, there's a whole bunch of skills that this child would now be able to learn that the younger child would not be able to. It would be impossible. So let's look at slightly older age child. So this is a little bit later. Here we have something that's called concrete operations. And we have a child who's able to work out basic arithmetic if she draws it on a chalkboard. She has to make it concrete. But if she can make it concrete, she can see it. She can see that 2 plus 2 equals 4, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and so on. For the older child, the older child has something different happening. The older child, they, they call this, uh, Piaget calls this formal op operations. The older child is able to internalize all of those operations. They don't have to work it out on a chalkboard. So that's what makes possible. These older kids are now able to play chess. That younger child could not possibly ever play chess, not because that child is more stupid or more ignorant or less skillful. It's just that the complexity of mind is not there. OK, so I feel like the point seems clear. OK, so what about adults? <clears throat> so, <worst>. huh? <laughs> what's that? They regress. <laughs> <laughs> no, they actually don't, thankfully. Otherwise, we would be in real trouble, right? You think we're in trouble now, we would be, well, actually, maybe some, some, <laughs> okay. I get the point. <laughs> so, so I want to take us through three fundamental sort of transformations of sense making that happen in adults all right so the first one is um is instant what, what i'm calling an institutional mind again i'm using i'm slightly adjusting the terminology to make it a bit more accessible for a 45 minute talk um, so institutional mind it's a quality of sense making in which we are we are able to truly relate with another person we're able to see another person as separate from ourselves and, but our tendency is that we tend to um, like overly identify with them. So for instance, um, it might be a boss, or it might be somebody we report to, or it might be somebody who we really respect. And we don't want to disappoint them. And so we do whatever we can to not disappoint them. So in a sense, we've identified OK, I'm, I'm going to use a funny term here. We've identified with our, our idealization of that person. We actually kind of don't really know who that person is. So think about people who you really respect and who, and who you would, you, you know, when you, like I just met somebody who, like super famous guy, uh, 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 who I admire and respect. Uh, and um, it was just a happenstance meeting. And I was like, hada, 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 hada. You know, it's like I, I, I couldn't find myself because I, I dropped into this sort of institutionalized mind. I could not bring myself forth in that moment, right? And so, so coming from this complexity of inner sense making, it's really hard to think outside the box. So you can try, so you, you're thinking of those people who they, you wonder, God, why can't they just be more innovative, more creative? Chances are they live in this institutionalized mind. And there's a lot of great stuff about it, and there's a lot that's limiting about it. So the next sort of uh, st uh, stage or level of complexity of mind is um, what I'm calling intentional mind. By the way, this is all based on mostly the work of Robert Keegan. 
So, um, and he uses different words um, that I, um, I, I think um, make it a little bit harder to follow. Uh, but Robert Keegan, K-E-G-A-N, Robert Keegan. Um, so intentional mind is like the, is the next, it's the more, it's a more complex uh, uh, capacity, which is, it's the ability to own one's own inner compass, like to really be able to hold one's inner compass and to be able to be driven toward a larger goal and to hold their own in the face of adversity. So for someone at an institutionalized mind, that's very, very hard to do. To be able to stand, to stand the ground, even though you're getting a lot of disagreement, a lot of criticism, maybe you get fired. But to be able to stand your ground in the face of that is, is, a, is, is a fairly high level of complexity of mind. And again, when I use the word mind, I'm talking about somatic experience as well. Because here, oftentimes what we're dealing with is anxiety. Anxiety is like the biggest thing in all of this, which is a somatic experience, which is an aspect of mind. It's related to that, the, those microsecond sense-making things that are going on in us all the time. Okay, so the thing that's hard for, for, for a person operating primarily from this perspective or from this um, kind of a level of mind it's hard to think beyond our own perspective. People are very sure of themselves and they tend to be limited by their own perspective. So the next sort of um, um, stop along this developmental journey is what I'm calling integrative mind, which is the ability to embrace multiple perspectives, to stand in the face of the unknown and be able to act in a leaderful and high a capability sort of way, all right? So, so what do you think of all that before I go to the next thing? It's, what does this bring to mind? Can we go back to yes, yep. So as an organization, so getting to the leadership aspect, so mm -hmm. putting aside the term leader, like mm -hmm. how many people of this mindset are really necessary um, well, in which mindset? You mean the integrative mind mindset? Sure, yeah. um, I would say that we need people at, at, across all of these levels. And we need more people who are operating, who are able to operate at integrative mind. We need more of them than we currently have, honestly. And it's not just at top, not just top level leaders. And when I say more of them, I find myself already speaking anthrop you know, in terms of anthropology. So the way that I look at this is that, what do I need to grow my, in myself to be able to better inhabit an integrative mind? So I prefer to think of it that way as opposed to, what do we need to do with those people out there? Good, what else does this bring to mind, all of this so far? Because I, I, I think I have just one or two more things I need to weave in here. There's the desire to Um, does the desire to, not, does, I love your precision of language, Craig. Predict and plan, right? Yeah. Does that sort of lead us down the road of we're going to eventually end up into an institutional mindset if we follow the predict and plan? Well, I, 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 I would say that, that predict, that the, pre, um, hmm, how would I say this? The, <clears throat> The nature of predict and plan finds a comfortable home within the institutional mind. I think that's what I was going yeah, yeah, yeah. It finds a comfortable home there. I almost think of it as a defense mechanism of the mind as it pertains to dealing with all of the complexity. The predict and plan yeah, is. It's like it's almost yes, a, yes, a, yes. Uh, if I do this predict yes, and plan, yes, then that can yeah. help make sense yes. of all of that. Because yes. I can't make sense of all of it in an yeah, that's, I think that's a really beautiful way to, to say that. And here's the thing, we, we, all, we all kind of move across these, right? So there, I'm oftentimes, very oftentimes, operating at institutional mind. You know, when I'm, when I'm feeling anxious or overwhelmed, 
we, 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 there, there are places we go to, there's a kind of, re, it's not really quite, I wouldn't call it regression necessarily, but it's just, you can think of this almost like, like an inner vocabulary, like what do we have, what ways of making sense do we have access to? And what I would suggest is that we want to increase, we want to increase the times when we're able to uh, get access to our integrative mind. We all have pieces of that in us. And we just want to increase how much of that we're able to uh, activate within ourselves. Yeah. Did that sort of uh, address what, okay. Yes, please, and then. Yeah, just one other point, right? And I think it's that first bullet point that's important as well. It's the embracing multiple perspectives. So again, an integrative mind incorporates the intentional mind and institutional mind as well. A a absolutely. So, so what uh, Ken Roberts just said, I'm, I'm speaking because I don't think that we have a microphone that can hear everybody. So what Ken Roberts said is that, that the first bullet point, embrace multiple perspectives, suggests that the integrative mind is able to hold both intentional mind and institutional mind, and that's absolutely the idea. That it's able to hold the healthy um, aspects of those. And in fact, as we grow further along, we're able to incorporate earlier sort of uh, um, sense-making um, structures uh, more in, in, a, in a more vital, uh, congruent, relevant sort of way. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Clive, and then, we'll, and then we'll come to you, David. So I guess what I'm trying to do is kind of integrate some of the threads yeah, yeah, yeah. So the ones that are standing out is when you talked about your inner journey and with Suzanne and the challenges, it's not like it's not like it's ever done, mm. right? We, it's never finished, right. yes. So that's one thread. The other is the distinction you're making between phenomenology and anthropology, the, yeah. the looking from the inside versus looking from the outside. Yeah. And then this slide here, because this sounds to me as you're describing it, much more anthropological. Like yes, people yes. Are looking from the outside yeah, yeah, and yeah. looking from within. So I'm trying to like, how do all those three fit together? You're, you're, you're forcing me to make this a bit more complex. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not my fault. <laughs> he made me do it. All right? So, so the question was is so that, that, that a moment ago, I was talking about approaching our sense making and, and mindset and culture from the perspective of anthropology versus phenomenology, and that I'm advocating that we pr approach it uh, from the perspective of phenomenology. And Clive cleverly pointed out, by the way, I was aware of this, and I was hoping I could sneak it by, but apparently not, right? So P Clive points that there's a kind of discrepancy because this seems as though I am treating the nature of inner sense making from the outside in, i.e., anthropologically. Is that kind of is that what you're pointing to? It's got a little, yeah. know, it's got a little bit of a flavor of that. Yeah. Yes. That. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and and yes, it is. And um, how, how do I say this? Uh, does anyone have any ideas? <laughs> Help. <laughs> It's easier to understand it. Yeah. So, that, so that's the yeah. thing. In, in this, when, I, when I'm doing this kind of thing, like it's a 45 minute or 60 minute talk, I have to take some shortcuts. Yeah. And I always have to decide what I need to leave out. So what I can say about this is that, okay, get ready. All right, you guys ready? <laughs> this is a way of looking at the phenomenology of mind anthropologically. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. There's, yeah, yeah. Is that, do you buy that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now think about, now you guys are smart people. Give me a break. You don't understand that? Are you mean to tell me you don't understand what I just said? I don't believe it. It sounded good because it is good. So in what way did it sound good? Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, I am! You want to make something of it? Uh, we, got, we get the point that you're trying to say that it is very, very complex. Yes. 
Well, yeah, it is, it is complex, but the basic idea to, to, to what's your name? Yusuf, sorry. Yeah, Yusuf? Yusuf. Yeah. yeah, Yusuf. So what Yusuf said is that I'm just trying to make this, you know, take out some of the complexity in order to make it accessible, all right? So thank you for allowing me to kind of like play with you and tease you like that, um, especially you in the back over there. <laughs> Okay, good. So, where are we going with all this? Um, as we grow the complexity of our inner sense making, did, did I already say that? I can't remember. It seems like I already said that, but maybe it's just because I read it this morning. <laughs> yeah, so I, apparently I haven't said it yet, so I'll say it now. So, as we grow the complexity of our inner sense making, the situations we encounter become far less challenging. Thus, okay, this is the punchline of the whole talk. Right? Thus, we want to be deliberate about growing the complexity of our inner sense making. We want to be deliberate about it. We don't want to just leave it to happenstance, hope it, hope it works out, which is pretty much what we do in the Agile world. When it comes to anything having to do with inner development, inner leadership, we, 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 say, some, we say some things, we, we propose some theories, some models, and then <clears throat> we hope for the best. All right? And I am advocating that we can do better than that because we have a whole science of psychology, of executive coaching, of leadership development. We have so much to support us in not only thinking about this, but to actually have very specific practices that we can use. Just like we have practices for outer agility, we have scrum practices, right? And we go, we go to a lot of trouble to learn scrum practices, to teach them, to figure out how to best teach them. There's a whole industry around that. And I've been around in the scrum world since the beginning of scrum. Since Ken Schwaber, I was probably among the first 100 uh, scrum masters to be certified by Ken Schwaber. And I was probably among the first one dozen scrum trainers to work with Ken Schwaber. So I've been around in the scrum world for a long time. And believe me, we work really, really hard and then people say, you want me to do a three-day workshop on this stuff? You've got to be kidding. But we can be deliberate about increasing the complexity of our sense making. So, deliberate sense making. The first thing I want to say about it is that it is a social practice. It can't be done, okay, so there's some people say it can be done individually. You know, there's meditation, there's all, yes, yes there is. Um, and I'm not quite sure what else to say about it, except that um, as best as I've been able to tell, that as long as we are social beings, we need to be in a social environment in order to grow ourselves as social beings. I, you know, and I may be missing something on that, so, and, that, and that's, you know, maybe my own bias. So. It's a vocabulary, it's a set of practices and conditions. Very specific vocabulary. So what we notice is that when we introduce, vocabulary is another word for distinctions. When we introduce new, distinction is a language uh, act that helps us distinguish something from a background that was otherwise indistinct. So for instance, scrum master is a distinction. It's a word, but it's a word that points to a new category of meaning making that helps us be able to do things, to say things, to operate in ways we couldn't possibly do before. Is that, would you agree with that? Same thing with product owner. So much of what we are dealing with in the agile world, in the, out, the world of outer agility, are distinctions or, or, or vocabulary. A vocabulary helps us see reality differently. So it's really, really powerful. Practices. So practices are things. So when agile teams practice doing their daily stand-ups, so when I'm working with new uh, uh, scrum teams, they say, well, we don't think we need to do daily stand-ups every day. We just need to do them a couple times a week. I say, OK, so here's the thing. Try it for five sprints. And then let's check and see. What do you think about it? And what happens over the course of five sprints is that 
the practices teach them a deeper principle. Then practicing those practices teach them a, a deeper principle. In this case, it's the principle of the power, the power of holding each other accountable, the power of being really clear about where we are in our goal so we can adjust appropriately, the power of being able to micro-tune ourselves on a day-by-day, -day, even hour-by-hour -hour way. So, that it's like a, it's like a, so the practices make possible a new kind of mindset. And then finally, conditions, the conditions that we create. What's possible to do and what's not possible to do. Okay, so. <clears throat> Yeah. If, yeah. By going through those practices within ourselves, we get the aha. Yes. Get it. Yes. Me training or teaching it, it sounds good, but then I don't really get it. Yeah. It so, so what I would say about, so I agree completely. So, do you think the microphone was able to hear you? Maybe. Probably. Yeah. yeah okay. So what I would what I would say about that, abs absolutely, that we teach practices. Not because the point is the practices. We teach practices so that people can practice those practices over the course of time. And it usually takes many months for a regular practice of practices to stimulate uh, a shift in mindset. It does, and it doesn't always work, because other things have to exist, like the existence of a clear vocabulary, uh, for instance. And, and clear conditions. So there's lots of things that have to exist. This is kind of like they all synergetically support each other. You need all of them. So. Can you just touch, I'm sorry, on yeah, the conditions? Yeah. I just missed yeah. I the first two really yeah. The yeah, so, so the conditions are what, um, what's, what's the nature of the environment that we're in? You know, so like for instance, um, agile teams that are not co located one of the most common complaints that we hear, right? Well, it's really possible for agile teams who are not co-located to work together and be really effective. It's just that they need certain conditions to exist. They need access to really, really, really good um, technology, right? And, and, or we need to rethink the way teams are constructed. So rather than having uh, 20 teams, all of which are distributed across the world, have um, three teams here, four teams here, um, uh, whatever, how many, three teams here. So those are all, that has to do with the conditions in which, I'm using this as a specific example, but the conditions are the conditions in which we operate. Does that, does that help? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, so, so I wanna just show you um, just by the way, this is just a sliver. What, what I'm walking through is just a sliver of what's in the book. So I'm taking a ton of shortcuts, right? So, and what's in the book and then what's also in our workshop. So, um, so I wanna lay these out. So these are, these are four deliberately developed mental practices uh, with, within Evolve Agility. The first one over here is developmental growth and it's not like development so it's developmental growth the way that we've been talking about it here to help people increase their complexity of mind and there are certain vocabularies and there are certain practices which help people grow themselves developmentally so there are certain tools that we can use there are certain practices that we can introduce there's certain vocabularies, all of which support developmental growth. And I don't really, if someone asks more about it after this, we, we can talk about it, but that's all I'm gonna say about it right now. These come from the world of, again, from executive coaching, from developmental psychology, from even to a certain extent, group dynamics. So the thing down here, deliberately developmental conversation is a kind of conversation, it's a kind of coaching conversation that helps another in their developmental growth. So it's a specific kind of conversation that has very deliberately specified kinds of practices 
that can help another and actually help us both grow developmentally. So the practice of de deliberately developmental conversation helps us grow, helps others grow developmentally. Then over here, and I'm just doing a really cursory uh, uh, glance at this because it's, otherwise it's gonna be exhausting. Shared sense-making conversation is a conversation that we have within a collective. So it could be like a partnership, two people, or it could be a group or a team. Usually it's not much larger than seven people or eight people, um, in which we are, we are growing ourselves as a relationship system. That we are growing our capability as, as a relationship system, our capability, our ability to be in alignment, our ability to collaborate, our ability to cleanly communicate, our ability to deal with conflict in a constructive way, to be able to leverage conflict to help us get at our differences. And then finally, the thing at the top, deliberately developmental feedback, is feedback that helps people tune into their impact on other people in a way that helps them see how their own inner sense making might uh, play into all of that. Okay, so I can't remember where we're going next. Okay, so this is actually the last thing. And then we can have a, like, a, like a conversation, all right. Um, so <clears throat> all of this, making a you know, gigantic a leap here, all of this is about helping us move from thinking of the organization as a factory. Because most organizations really are still factories. We think of ourselves, our essential purpose is to produce products or to produce things. And we think innovation is happening because we get better at producing these products. And I'm not saying that that's not true, but in today's VUCA world, it's, it's, a, it's a poor, it's an impoverished way of thinking about organizations. That I'm inviting us to think about organizations not only, not only as, fact, as a factory, but as a curriculum. That organizations are a laboratory that promotes inner development, that promotes the growth of complexity of mind such that people in those organizations, the teams within those organizations, the relationship systems within those organizations have the capacity to deal with the complexity they're facing such that the organization is able to, better able to do what it is it's here to do. Okay. All right, so let's, oh, let's open it up. So let's have a conversation. Um, how he was accepted? Yeah, I mean, when he died, nobody liked him. I, I used to be vaguely aware of that. Yes, yes. So yep. the, my point being that yeah, he yeah, basically yeah. fit into this category of like looking at things, and, and then to a large degree, his philosophy became doctrine within the defense department. Yeah. So, so he. So his. So uh, so how I would translate that into the language that we've introduced here is that. Boyd is somebody who's, who, um, who, who had a complexity of mind. He was able to see things in a way maybe that other people weren't seeing at the time. Well, I would argue that yeah. so Boyd just happened to get lucky that, um, yeah. that there are a lot of people that try to take on this mindset. Uh -huh. As you say, don't, it doesn't fall out too well. I mean, uh -huh. it didn't fall out well for him, but yeah. Like, yeah. at least his ideology caught on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay. For those, Boyd is OODA loop, right? Yeah, observe oriented. Observe oriented is I add yeah. the fighter yeah. pilot and then later changed the way that the Air Force engaged uh -huh. in combat and then it broadened out to the whole defense department's model of <coughs> adversaries. Mm -hmm. um, also, what do you make of AI's role in systems like this? Um, I, I, don't make, I don't make anything of it. Okay. Because, I mean, you were talking, so like the the question was, is how do I, what do I make of AI in all of this? And, and so my, but in terms of observing yeah, yeah. things, it, it actually increases our ability to observe things that otherwise that most people would not observe and model the world. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess um, I, I, I think that's all well and good. I just don't, um, AI is, I mean, I think it's, you know, so, sort of interesting, but it's, for me, it's not at all germane um, uh, to this. I, I, I'm much more interested in real intelligence, like, you know, and, but, in, but deep intelligence, the, the, you know, really, really deep intelligence. So I saw a hand come up over here. Yeah. A comment um, earlier uh, where you said anxiety is the biggest thing. Uh, anxiety I'm going to give you my mic so you can speak into the mic. <laughs> for the, this, because this is being live streamed. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, you had said that anxiety is the biggest thing. Um, and I'm curious, uh, how did that connect with the rest of the thoughts you were laying out? How does anxiety play in with sh shared sense, sense making? Because, because anxiety is, is a, uh, is a uh, to use, um, to go back to Simon, it's a, uh, it, it, it's embodied, it's an embodied thought. Anxiety is an embodied thought. So it begins with how we are, the, the, the nature of the sense making we're bringing to the current situation. And again, much of this, what, what I'm referring to is that inner sense making is something of which we are unconscious of. Now, the whole point of deliberate sense making is to help ourselves become more conscious of that inner sense making so that we can then become more choiceful about it, so that we can actually become more choiceful. Now, the, the, one of the biggest issues, that, at least I know for myself and for other people that I work with, is anxiety. Anxiety. What anxiety is doing is it's telling us that the current situation is inherently dangerous and that we better run or we better fight. And oftentimes, the current situation is not at all dangerous. We're not being chased by a leopard, right? We're, 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 we're being chased by uh, our inability to make sufficiently complex meaning of the situation at hand. That's, what's, that's the tiger that's chasing us. So, yeah. so like, does that, I'm sorry, sorry. Well, I know I yeah. to build on this because yeah. it's a, yeah. Yeah. you know, anxiety in terms of, anxiety as elevated levels of stress is one of the m most consistent depressors of our, of our complexity of mind. So there's nothing that'll push us back into a more primitive state of reactivity than higher levels of stress. So our, you know, like our ability to manage anxiety goes along with our ability to, to access these more, you know, these more complex forms of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I love that, Clive. I, I, would, I, I would agree completely with that. That, that you know, partly like how I, how I deal with anxiety when I'm at my best is that I read it as a barometer of possibility. Like I, I read a, a, a Buddhist teacher said one time, it's not about following your heart. It's about following your fear. It's going where your fear is, and that's where the, that's where the possibility is. And so development, so, so being, deliberately, being deliberate about our development, about our growing the complexity of our inner sense making, it, it, it's, it's, it's not for sissies. It really isn't. It, it's not an easy road. It's not like becoming a happier person. It's becoming more congruent with like a vision for the world. It's becoming um, more functional. I, I had a spiritual teacher once who defined enlightenment as no longer causing problems for other people. I mean, think about that. That's a really high bar. And what it would be like, what would be the nature of my complexity, the complexity of inner sense making that determines how I am in the world, what would it be like if I were such that I, I could actually hold equanimity in the face of whatever complexity is coming at me, inclu including the complexity of my anxiety in the face of something that's going on in a relationship that's completely baffling to me. Because that often happens, doesn't it? Don't we often get baffled? We get baffled. And it's that bafflement, bafflement 
Bafflement, is that a right, is that a word? Bafflement, is that a word? David, I trust your authority on the matter. Yeah, yeah, so according to David, bafflement is a word, all right? You heard it from him, right? So our bafflement is a signal of being in over our heads, to use a phrase from uh, Robert Keegan. Being in over our heads, not being stupid or ignorant, but that the level of complexity of the current situation is above the level of complexity that we, of, of our own minds. And so we experience being baffled, or we experience losing confidence, or any number of other, other kinds of psychological things that happen. Yes, please. Yeah, you, wanna, sure. you wanna speak to the microphone? Uh, I don't know if I should. Yeah, you don't know if you should? I'm gonna ramble a bit. Okay, all right. Okay. I, this is a really good I talk. Yeah. No, no, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it was a really good talk, thank you. So um, I guess it's interesting to me, because I've, I've been a tester, and now I'm a test manager or whatever for uh, quite a while, and one of the that sort of things that I've always clung to and been useful to me is kind of playing the fool a little bit and asking the questions. And yes. even though you see that you know other people may not get it, sometimes you ask for everyone yeah. else in the room. Um, and then I've seen that with Scrum Masters too, the ones who I admired who are really good. And you know that kind of got me onto the whole Agile thing. Um, but uh, even the best ones that I've seen have ended up kind of what you touched on at the beginning, kind of just hitting a wall. And eventually, just getting yeah. tougher and tougher. Like you know, I bake bread, so I know what you meant with the whole stirring uh, thing. Yeah. yeah, it's tough. So I guess uh, what I'm con not confused, but thinking about is because I, I like you, I have a, a meditative practice and things like that that I do. Is that the kind of prescription, if anything, that you're giving from this, from the result of this talk? Is that we need our own personal meditative or some sort of uh, mindfulness practice, or is it something else? Because to me, that's what I'm taking from it, and that's fine. But yeah, right, okay. Yeah. So, so that's the question. Right. So I, I wanted to say something about this thing about being a fool, that um, in Shakespeare, the fool is always the smartest person in the room. We can say, we can say the truth. Yeah, they're not smart because necessarily they're not nece necessarily more intellectually smart than anybody else but they're able to see the larger reality. And they're able to articulate what they're seeing in a way that is actually, it's very powerful form of communication. I call it, I, I, I call it um, disequilibrium, or uh, in the world of coaching, we call it a rug pull. Pulling the rug out from underneath what people believe is, all, what people believe is true. So to, so to come to your question, I, I, I would say there are practices. Yes, meditation is, is one, or you know, you know, that kind of practice, but I, I believe that it's in, that by itself is insufficient, especially, especially if we work and operate in any kind of a social environment. Right, you talked about the idea of social as sort of up against that idea of loneliness. Yes, and right. So we, so we really need social practices that help us grow not just individually but as relationship systems. If our relationship systems don't, around us don't grow, we're not, it's going to be hard for us to grow. I've known a lot of people who do a lot of meditation who are in absolutely failed marriages and are ineffective at working with other people. Sorry to say that, but I wouldn't say that's true for the most advanced meditators necessarily, but the ones I know, including myself, <laughs> mainly myself. <laughs> Simon. So, so, oh. Sorry, is this, is this a pain in the neck? That I, but it, because I want, I want everybody who's not in the room to be able to hear this. Uh, so it was the idea of this being a social practice. Yes. Um, and whether we're in any of these states of mind, um, it's all about relationships. Yes. And, and it's even more so about the relationship if we're trying to get to the integrated mind. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, Clive Prout is one of the people who has helped me really be clear about that. He's sitting right here. <laughs> Are you embarrassed, Clive? Yeah. Oh, but you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, you want to say something. But now. you haven't finished with me yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, I think this, like, so this social practice piece that you, that you touched on there, right, that the most effective practices that we know of for helping develop this complexity of mind are social practices. And specifically, that is the realm of coaching. That's the realm of 
developmental coaching. So if you if you're really serious about this, the 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 that's the that's the kind of the most direct, intensive way to do it is in a coaching relationship. It's expensive, right? It's ex it's a it's a it's a it's a very expensive proposition. So so there are approximations to that that are, that, it, that are less expensive, which is like peer coaching. But it's all around coaching technology. So that's what we're talking about. Well, I think that's what we're talking yeah. about. Well, okay. So I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to differ slightly with that. I'm going to build on it and differ slightly. Yes, and the, the thing that I, because um, I, before I actually went into agile coaching, I was a professional coach. And so I had like a one-on-one -on -one coaching practice. And then when I started working in a corporate environment and bringing kind of coaching into that environment, what I started doing was working not so much one-on-one, -on -one, but with groups, working with leadership teams and so on. And I, I, found, I found that what happens when groups develop something like the kinds of skills that we develop in ourselves when we become professional coaches, and they can do that within their groups, that, is, that for me is the, the most powerful developmental environment. And that's kind of like a big thing that, um, a big deal that, 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 that I make in the book is the, the power of social practices practiced socially. All right. So, Michael, we yes. have a question on, uh, on the chat I wanted to uh, bring out. Uh, how would you trigger deliberate sense making? I should be able to pick up on this thing. Okay. How would you trigger deliberate sense making in members of an organization? Does it have to come from within the individual, or is there a way for us as leaders, coaches, to inspire it in others? This is from B. 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 Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry because I got I just a tad distracted. I, yep, I apologize. Yep, yep. Yeah. So how would you trigger yeah. deliberate sense making in members of an organization? Does it have to come from within the individual or is there a way for us as leaders, coaches, to inspire it in others? Well, I, I would say that it's both. That um, it, it's kind of, um, uh, it recognizes the, the dialectical nature of reality, that, that you actually need both. That you need individual development, and um, so individuals need to take responsibility for their own development, and we need to be able to create deliberately developmental environments that not only inspire that, not only empower it, but enable that. Is there a fire in the building? I see a lot of movement. No, sorry, no okay. We, okay. <laughs> <laughs> does, um, does that, I mean, I know you're not the person who asked the question, but does that, does that seem reasonable, what I'm saying? I think so. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. What, what do others think of that? There'll be a delay, like, if that person does respond. So okay, I'm okay. Behind. All right. Yeah, hopefully I answered that, or I don't know. What else? Well, maybe we could just say a little bit more about what shared sense making uh -huh. involves, because that yeah. question seems to suggest. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And we're each making sense of it individually. And to the extent that we're able to pool those different perspectives, a, you know, a, a, a fuller, more shared sense making might be possible. Right. So it's, it's inherently something that you can't do on your own. Yeah, so for instance, so the way that, one way to think about, so just to say a little bit more about shared sense making, one way to think about it is, um, the poor camera is trying to follow me and I, I'm, I'm like all over the place. Um, so one way to think about shared sense making is that it is a deliberate practice. So there's, there's a whole set of kind of, I don't want to say necessarily techniques, but there are practices. It's a very, it's a kind of a protocol actually to it. So it begins when a group comes together, it could be a team, and there's some kind of situation or challenge that they're faced that is meaningful to them, it's important to them. And, um, and they set about talking about it, having a conversation about it in a way 
that explicitly and deliberately reveals the inner sense making, the shared sense making they are holding such that they see the challenge or the situation the way that they do. So, for instance, it could be a conflict that they're having as a team. It's a recurrent conflict. And so they may come together as a team and they may start to ask each other some very specific questions. So one question they might ask each other is, so what is it that we're making up about our conflict? So notice it's a very carefully worded question. What do we make up about what's happening? And a number of people will say, well, what, what I make up about it is, uh, about our conflict is that, um, mm, uh, that we, th we think that our conflict is insurmountable. That's one thing that we're making up. So one person might say, what I make up is that our conflict is insurmountable. And, another pr and what that does, and then somebody else might say, so what's the nature of the assumption that you're holding such that you make that up? And that person might say, wow, that's an interesting question. Hmm. Well, I guess what I, what, what I would say to that is that I assume that all conflicts are insurmountable once they get to a certain point. That's my assumption. And so if over the course of the conversation we can continue to examine what we're making up and what our assumptions are, we come out the other end with a different way of looking at that situation, in this case the example being our conflict. And we have a different way of seeing it. I feel like that's about as much as I want to say about it right now. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit of kind of like, like, are we kind of near done? I, I, I don't know what time it is. Uh, 810. Uh, 810. Certainly, yeah, go by energy of the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, if you don't mind, I'll yeah. uh, chime in. Kind of yeah. what snaps together. And yeah. I hope I don't uh, offend anybody or, or touch on anything that might be a little, uh, I don't know what. But there is a, uh, anybody familiar with Key and Peel? It's a sketch comedy on Comedy Central. They did one sketch about uh, one of them who could make sense of why they bullied. Of why they bullied. Like, what's that? Of why they bullied. Why they bullied. It was, yeah. you know, their father yeah. you know, would beat mm -hmm. them up kind of thing. It mm -hmm. would, would be very, um, you know, very in touch with it. And it, that's a funny spin on it, but yeah. very powerful as far as, like, if only bullies could yeah. understand yeah, yes. that's the right. reasons behind yeah. it. I don't yeah. say that, you know, I'm a bully or anything yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's kind of connecting for me is that at a much, you know, maybe a higher level of thinking, like what is it that I'm doing um, habitually or at a subconscious level yes. that I'm not aware of yes. that I need to evoke that awareness yeah, that's right. so that that's I can right. be more with that. Right, stuff. right, right. So, so if you and I were having a conversation, like a deliberately developed mental conversation, that would be the nature of the kinds of questions I might ask you. So what is it that you make up about that? And, and, and how does the world appear for you in that moment? And so you can imagine then when, when groups start to do this kind of work together, they start to be able to examine their own culture. The, because culture is really embedded assumptions, uh, embedded beliefs. And so like what you're speaking to, the whole culture of, of bullying, I mean, to a certain degree, I, I, I think I kind of bully. Anytime I insist on something, especially with my wife, in a way that's dominating, that's a kind of bullying. So I'm not, that's not necessarily true, but it's a perspective that gives me access to a different way of making sense of what happens in those moments when I have that kind of conversation with my wife and she feels hurt. She ends up feeling hurt. So if I can look at it square in the face, not that it's true, but like, in what way might I be being a bully right now? I'm not a bully, not literally, but in a way I can be, but it doesn't matter because it's a thought that gives me access to a different way of making sense of the situation such that I can become more um, compassionate and sympathetic to another person's perspective. Does that make sense? We're, we're, using, we're using thoughts to tune our minds. 
Yes. Then I guess what you might ask yourself is what is it that's causing me to take that bullying sort of stance? What is it that I've been familiar with? Like you, you give a, the, that example of like every conflict when I surface the assumption that person makes. Yes. And then it feels insurmountable is that every conflict I've been in feels insurmountable. Yes. So maybe that, that situation, I guess, that evokes that sort of strong stance and bullying stance. Yes. Yes. What is it within you that's going yes. to evoke yeah. that? No, it's, it's beautiful, and I love the way that you're tracking the path of the inner assumption to our outer behavior. Because the inner assumption, there's no, we don't know what outer behavior it's going to connect to. It could connect to bullying. It could connect to just the opposite. It could connect to cowing. You know, so I tend to, when I'm in a conflict, my go-to place is to become um, withdrawn and um, <coughs> uh, conciliatory. You know, like I'll sell the farm to avoid being in this conflict kind of thing, right? So different behaviors come, uh, uh, one kind of pattern of assumption can yield all kinds of different behaviors. And it's useful to be able to trace back what's the assumption, what's the inner belief, the nature of the inner sense making that informs this behavior. And if I can do that, I have a much better chance at getting at the root source of that behavior as opposed to trying to change the behavior from the outside, which I've never been able to do in myself. So what do we want to do? I'm feeling a sense of tiredness. We may be done. Are we kind of done? Or what's the mood? Is there, yes, another? I just want to make sure. Yeah. I, I often don't understand things. Um, so I think can, can I? Do you mind if I give you a microphone yeah, here? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. My misunderstanding. Yeah. <laughs> um, at, least so, we, at least we all get to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So I had a, a, a manager at one point in my life say, don't take your past experiences as fact without gathering all the information. Yes, so don't, yes. don't use your assumption of a previous experience and make a blanket statement. Yes. And this was in the restaurant industry. And uh -huh. like that. I didn't like refilling the ketchup because it's just going to be emptied again, uh -huh. uh, and no one never uses the ketchup. So it's very, 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 very silly uh, thing to say. But um, I, I'm taking this kind of from both of y'all's perspective, in that um, when you when you make an assumption, it's a, a lot of your perspective as well. So going full circle. Am, am I understanding that you know you said at the beginning fear and excitement are the same feeling, but you perceive them? Well, the the same bodily sensation. Yeah, but bodily. Like, but they have different interpretations. Right? Yeah. Like thought associated. So, like the first that. time you went skydiving, yeah. you might have yeah. been terrified. Yes. The yes. Second, third, fourth, that yeah. terrified might turn into yeah. excitement. Yeah. Could so, be. Yeah. so you're perceiving that experience differently. Yes. So you thought of it as fact. This is my head's. Yeah. Just a spider web. At the no, moment. you're you know so, you're doing you're doing beautifully. Okay. Yeah, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so all of that to say, when you're thinking of a team, I'm just having a hard time connecting on how would the team come to that social get through. How would a team socially bring all of their ideas of the spider web out and come to a collective uh, assumption or decision or perception well, of their own problem. So um, I, I'm going to do my best to track, because that's a, that's a, a, that's a, that's a multi-layered, uh, actually, I would say that you, you're not confused at all. You have a complex mind. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, 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 thing, the thing for you is um, to be able to practice ordering the complexity. Okay. I mean, it's a practice. It's a skill that you can develop. And, and, and you, would become, you would become coherent in speaking from a place of complexity. Because I can tell you have a complex mind, but it's just that for somewhere along the line, you made the assumption that you're confused, and you're not. You actually have a complex mind, and if you can give up that interpretation of yourself that you're confused, you might actually then develop the courage to be able to create in yourself the kinds of practices that would help you render that complexity of thinking uh, such that it can be like accessible to other people. Okay. Is it okay that I'm saying this? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So um, 
I think I would say the same thing I just now said to you about that to this situation with the team. That there is some set of assumptions that, this, that any team has about themselves as a team that's keeping them stuck in some way. And if they can have a practice that helps them ac access those assumptions, reveal them. And by the way, you know, when you're in a team environment, team members know the inner assumptions of their other team members for the most part. The team member, that person may not see it themselves, but other people do. And so that's the beauty of the social practice of shared sense making because not only do we reveal our shared assumptions, but we reveal our own individual assumptions in an environment that's really safe, but you know, we talk straight. I have no idea if that no, that's in okay. any way addressed your question. No, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm well, thank you. I wrapped it up very well. Yeah. Yeah. Adam, thank you for trying to keep <laughs> <laughs> Adam, I really love Poor that. Adam. You know, he's on Pacific time still. <laughs> he's been here for three weeks, but he's still on Pacific time. <laughs> uh, what kind of snapped? I love the, the, the analogy yeah, of like yeah. jumping out of the plane for the first yes, time. Yeah. Super anxiety, yeah, super anxious, yeah. but then after the fifth or sixth time, you're excited about it. And the metaphor I kind of put together is like, if we can only get the team, to kind of jump out of the plane at least once. Uh -huh. It's anxious, you know, yeah, but yeah, then yeah. You, yeah. you allow them to do it four, yeah. five, six times and actually get excited about having yeah. those yeah. kind of powerful conversations yeah, 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 in, yeah. inside of the team. So that, yeah. that's, I don't know. If it's so, I, so, so I'd even take it one step further. What if at the moment that we're getting ready to jump out of the team, we, can, we could convince ourselves to, to create a different interpretation for ourselves of our experience? That in fact, what we're experiencing right now is excitement, not fear. What, what if we could do that with, with our teams? I mean, it, it sounds like magic, but, you know, going to the moon 200 or 300 years ago would have been considered magic. Having wheels on suitcases <laughs> 100 years ago would have been considered magic. Oh, well, so, yeah, cool. So shall we wrap it up then? There? Yeah? Great. Okay. Um, everybody who has been with me during the streaming and who will watch the video, um, thank you also for um, being here. And thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you for uh, a wonderful, what I experienced as a wonderful evening. All right. Thank you.